fusion um, scene. That means just fusing um, Stampscape stamps with stamps from other companies. This one happens to be a Gumbo Graphics uh, design that I bought at Paws on Main. Wow, Cambria, California, years ago. And uh, 100 Proof Press. Now, um, Gumbo Graphics isn't around any longer, but I do believe Stamp Francisco has them. So it's this eyeball right here. Now, this composition that I'm going to be doing, I've done similar compositions in the past. Um, I don't really recall when I did it, but um, I don't know. It's kind of been uh, this kind of this theme that I like using. I, I really love this um, character right here with his back to us and... I don't know, it looks like it's conjuring uh, something or, or praising, and I really like that. Uh, I'll put all the code numbers for these stamps uh, down at the bottom, should anyone be interested. Okay, so I have a half-page uh, piece of glossy cardstock. I don't even know what paper it is. It looks really tattered and kind of beaten up, but hey, you know, we can still use it. We're going to keep this um, composition pretty... Um, Simple in terms of the color scheme, okay? Um, most of the drama and whatnot is going to be uh, brought into the composition with the use of um, tone, shadow, and color. So I'm just going to be doing most of the, um, uh, the composition as far as the, uh, the imagery goes, just with black ink. I might be doing versions of black, like such as... Um, Kind of using a, a drier impression going with gray but we'll see how it goes here okay so stamping out some impressions with the cloud cumulus if you've seen these videos before you'll know that i'd like to kind of wipe off the perimeter of my kind of rectangular formatted sky images and it just gives me a little bit more of a graceful transition into the open area okay so that means just any perimeter area that we might be uh uh, using, and in this case, it's going to be a cloud base with this rock coming out of it. A lot of people don't think to use it that way, but I use this cloud cumulus for a lot of different things that um, a lot of people don't really think about. I use it at the, in my water, at the base of waterfalls. I use it, um, I don't know, at the base of mountains to give... Um, mountains a feeling of grandeur and scale you know coming out of the mountains talk you know it gives you a kind of a feeling of um, elevation this is the boulders with lichen here and that's what my character is going to be standing on now you notice I didn't have to mask off any of that cloud because I transitioned my designs off very carefully and how they um, how they are they're um, designed on the perimeters, okay? Now, I did wipe off a little bit of this where it's going to transition into that cloud, but, you know, you can do that or you don't have to. It, it doesn't really matter too much, okay? And just to continue that boulder out there to give it a little bit of an extra um, extension there, I've just taken this and I've overlapped that previous impression by about a half inch, okay? All right, now... What we're going to do is, I have a video that I've done in the past where we're talking about sandwiching images, okay? Um, you can think about things in terms of three dimensions. That's one of the things that I really kind of focus on in my scenes. I'm not really thinking in terms of two dimensions. I'm working on a two-dimensional um, format here, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to think in three dimensions in terms of distances, okay? All right, so this cloud right here is going to be sandwiching this rock, okay? Now, I didn't, I, you could mask that off, okay? But I didn't even bother. I just stamped that, and I stamped it right over my um, rock there. And why doesn't that cloud look like there's a big rectangle right in that rock right there. Well, it's because I wiped it off down there, so it's stamped out very lightly. And plus, going back to what I was talking about with my transitions, the transitions are the most important thing as far as um, kind of incorporating stamps in with each other. And if you do that, if you take uh, the time in the stamp designing process to do it properly, 
really makes it easier for the viewer, I mean, uh, for the user, to utilize the stamps without having to worry about all that fussy kind of masking um, processes, okay? All right, so you get that rock right in there. You have clouds up here and clouds down here. All right, now this, what it's going to look like is this mountain's going to be coming out of here, and we're going to have this kind of explosion of uh, whatever, magma, lava, whatever. This billowing cloud, okay? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to utilize this cloud here, and I'm going to surround that entire plume, that explosive plume, to uh, give it some additional drama and texture, okay? So I'm taking this cloud. Now, each time I stamp this, I'm wiping off this top portion after I ink it up, and it's going to go like this, this, when I come up here, it's rotated around like this, this, like that. So it's going to give me this kind of opening right in the billows, okay? So if you just simply take your time to wipe off the perimeter, you don't have to wipe off the bottom portion like down here, because that bottom portion is going off the page, you see? So the only portion that I'm stamping out as far as the perimeter goes is this top portion. But that top portion stamped over my light source is now the bottom, so it's bottom lit. Do you see how that goes? Okay. So pretty easy process right here, okay? A lot of people say, oh my gosh, you know, it's, yeah, it's easier for you to say, well, stamping out a stamp like this, you know, is no harder than stamping out a stamp like this, okay, right? A lot of people think that um, the more intricate a stamp is and the more um, kind of detailed the stamp is, a lot of times people just kind of inherently think that stamping out a highly detailed stamp is harder than stamping out, you know, a word stamp or something like that. Well, it's not. It's harder to draw it like that, but it's not harder to stamp it out. Stamping out is making an impression like that, right? And it's no different than taking a, a word stamp or a stamp of a hand or whatever, and just stamping it out. It's still just fundamental stamping. But, I don't know. That's, I, that's how a lot of people feel, though, because of the end result. That's like, I don't know, probably 15,000 little dots right here on this scene right here, okay? And it looks more intricate because it is, but making an impression of you know, 10,000 little dots is not more difficult than doing, you know, stamping out a single line or something of that sort. Now, we're using it differently, but, uh, but in terms of just the process, okay? All right, so I'm really wiping off the bottom of this one where it's going to transition into those clouds down there, okay? I, may, I might have not left a whole lot of room for my... Uh, plume of uh, my explosive plume, but um, we'll try to make as much room as possible by stamping this fairly low and into those clouds, okay? So I've wiped off a lot of the bottom portion of this. Now see how I've wiped off the top of that? It's because I'm stamping this there. So see what I mean? You just kind of wipe off the perimeters of the different parts of the designs that are flowing into another design or another design, or another impression of itself. Just wipe it off. And it makes it really, really easy to incorporate and to um, kind of seamlessly and gracefully blend your images. Okay, now this one right here, I'm kind of debating on whether or not I want to use black. I think I am going to go fairly dark. It's a fairly delicate stamp in terms of it's a just dot pattern, okay? So if you stamp it too lightly, it won't show up. And I plan on using some um, bright colors in here to kind of represent this kind of explosive um, magma um, type of uh, event going on. So I'm going to stamp it fairly dark. All right, now my pad is really dry. Um, I just re-inked it fairly recently, but boy, it's been like... 80s, 90s, and very dry out here. I feel like I'm in, uh, I don't know, Arizona. <laughs> there. 
was mentioning on my previous video that um, I really like how when I start toning my images and how uh, quickly they dry out in, uh, you know, when we're doing conventions out in Arizona, I love it because I don't have to wait for my inks to dry before I can apply more inks. Things like pigment inks on glossy cardstock dry fairly quickly, you know, relatively quickly. All right, so that's what we have right there. All right, now zero masking needed and tons of overlapping in here. But you just don't need to mask if you do that kind of wiping out, you know, around the side. Perimeters like that. And that's with, I don't know, 95% of the stamping I do. Sometimes you do have to pull out a, a you know, a mask, but um, not uh, very often. Okay, so this one right here, um, I'm going to stamp this figure in black, okay? Right over the top of that. I'm kind of debating on whether or not I want to stamp him in uh, a really dark, um, versifying black when I'm done with this, or do I stamp him out right now? I'm not sure. This area right here, maybe I should have wiped off a little bit more of that cloud where it was a little bit lighter so that this figure and silhouette will stand out a little bit more. So I'm thinking about going, putting them a little bit off-center like that in the lighter area. Okay, do you see how I'm kind of composing? I think I'm going to go right now, and uh, if I do utilize Versifying Black, I'll do it in the foreground imagery if I choose to use some of it so that it looks really dark in the foreground, okay. So putting this one off center, I usually don't do that. I usually have them right up the center, but I don't know, this might be kind of an interesting kind of a dynamic as far as creating a little bit of a diagonal. Okay, look how dramatic that is. We haven't added any color yet. And I always love um, incorporating um, other companies' stamp designs into my... Uh, pieces. Now, I'm thinking about putting this eyeball in here too. I'm, I'm not sure though. It was an interesting idea. Uh, yeah. I could kind of have it a little bit offset in the background. This is where I was thinking about doing this. I was thinking about doing this and then going for a lighter impression back in here. It might be a little bit too distracting, though. Now that I see this, it's really quite busy. I could stand. I can add my color in here, and you know, I can still decide to do that later. So maybe I'll do that um, for right now. I'll keep it under consideration. Okay, now let's let, take a look at some different colors that we'll use on here. Um, I know a lot of you like. I uh, really like um, distress inks. Why don't we use um, some distress inks for? Um, Kind of a base here okay so here's antique linen and here's walnut stain i, I use other things like um what is that o old paper or eh, i don't know i have so many of these here um but um well wherever they went i don't know where well, yeah, their distress inks went i have a big stack of them maybe they're in my uh, demo box but these are the two that i tend to use quite a bit because they're kind of on the, the lighter and darker end of the spectrum as far as as far as what they offer. Okay, this one this walnut ink isn't is not really super dark. But as far as that distress line goes, it's one of the it's kind of a mid-tone darker. So there's all kinds of other ranges in here. And uh, those are good to use, but um, I like these two right here especially. Th those have kind of come to be my favorites um, in the distress. Kind of brownish tinges. Okay, now, so for antique linen, that's going to be my base layer on here. All right. Now, I've mentioned this before. It's just a lot easier, a lot of times, just to use the reinker fluid, okay, rather than taking some kind of applicator and dabbing it into the pad, which doesn't absorb very much ink. Okay. I mean, that's enough. You know, pads aren't geared for that. Mostly, they're made to make impressions from. You know. But this ray anchor fluid is perfect, and I'm just sopping it up on a paper towel like that. Paper towels make the perfect applicator because they're made to be absorbent. Um, that's the whole idea of paper towels, right? To absorb liquid. 
or to dry your hands and whatnot. But what these are also good for, just like a sponge, is to transfer that ink too. It's not holding it in like uh, I don't know, some types of uh, materials. So as we take this on here, okay, that ink really transfers well. All right. Now this is my first color, so it's going to get fairly, you know, widespread usage, okay? But here's what I'm doing here. I'm going to leave some of these clouds nice and light because I want this to be my light source. And I want that light to be reflecting off something. So in other words, just don't tone everything out, okay? Now there's no set rule. It's not like, um, okay, I left a little bit of light there on that cloud, but... I left that one dark or something like that, you know. Uh, or if that cloud is light, then would this one be dark? It's it's not like that at all. You just leave something as light and, you know, you make other things darker. But you kind of oscillate it a little bit. I like to play contrast against one another. So, you know, if I have this light right here, maybe I'll make a little bit darker right here. You know, just, I don't know, just for variation, you can call it kind of like checkerboarding, okay? You can kind of think of things that way so that you train your eye to kind of um, oscillate things um, in terms of values and textures and uh, different colors. And I'll show you what that means too here in terms of application, not just tell you theory, okay? All right, so... See how this is light right here? So if that's going to be light, and I want it to really stand out, then I have to make this mo uh, mountain, it's the island mountain large, darker like that. See how much that really kind of makes that stand out? We have some um, light reflecting off of this cloud down here. Usually this part of the cloud facing the light is going to be the lightest, so around on the perimeter you can make it darker. Okay. Now where this um, rock is the boulders with lichen down here. What I'll do is I'll make a portion of that a little bit darker, okay, but have some of the light reflecting off of that rock as well. See that little portion of light right there? See how that really kind of stands out? A lot of people, when they first start doing coloring, they're thinking of outline designs where you color in the whole thing, but I make these um, images have volumes, okay? Meaning there's round edges, there's flat edges, there's textured edges, but most of it is, it's about values. So a lot of times what I do is I hit those darker areas with additional tone. See these darker areas of the cloud down here? You just darken in those, okay? Especially with your lightest of inks, okay? You don't have to do it with the darkest of inks, okay? But see that now? Now it looks like the light is reflecting off of those clouds like that. And then I want this part of the cloud to stand out a little bit more. So you take this area right behind it and make it a little bit darker. Okay? Now this is just the first color. I mean, there's... Don't worry about making mistakes or anything like that. If you color in way too much and say, oh my god, I lost all my um, white of the paper, okay, uh, don't worry about it. Just um, create more lighting when you move into your darker tones, okay? Be more selective with your medium and darker tones when you get to those ones, okay? So don't just keep coloring in everything completely uniform. By and large, what you do is you keep uh, you try to retain your lighter areas when you move into your incrementally darker colors that you use. And this is talking about with not just dye-based inks and this kind of coloring process, but you can do the same type of principle with chalks, pastels, colored pencils. One of my favorites lately are alcohol inks. This is just one of the pretty fast ways to work, okay? You can see how much coverage you get and how much um, lighting established you can uh, create um, just with even one color. And it's really fast when you use those re-inkers. Okay, now a lot of times people are a little bit concerned because on certain types of papers and you stamp something out, 
Then you start toning it in. It's like, oh my god, that's really kind of smearing around. Well, if you look at my paper towel, it picked up a lot of that black ink. I didn't allow the black ink to really dry for very long. But when you're blending like this and toning, okay, what are we doing? We're creating shadows. So if we do get some black since creating gray in those shadow areas, that works for us. So see that? I don't worry about any of that type of thing. If you're doing kind of outline designs and you're doing this pure coloring in, you know, in an area, no one wants to see linear designs like the, you know, an outline design kind of blurred out. But these are tonal designs. So if that is blurring out, those little dots are blurring out a little bit, those little blurry, you know, dots are just, they can enhance everything because it's creating a gray. And that's what we want. We're creating these this idea of shadows. Now, I mean, I don't want it to just smear across and, you know, kind of lose my, you know, designs completely or something like that. But, you know, it, it's usually not doing something like that. Okay, so let's move to our um, walnut stain here, okay? It's a little bit dark. I don't have the re-inker for walnut stain, I don't think. See how much darker that is? Okay, so see what I'm doing here is I'm staying a little bit more perimeter oriented. So see, so you don't go into the light area with your, you know, your medium and darker tones. I mean, you can a little bit, but um, by and large, you kind of stay in the kind of shadow areas. You got to let your eye be the judge of it. I mean, if you get into an area like this and say, all right. That's light right there, but I think it looked darker than just tone it over like that. But do kind of keep an eye on how things are developing. You know, when you add some color in here, pause and take a look at it and kind of uh, critique it in that area. Does it, should it get darker? Do you want more walnut stain? Did you add enough antique linen? If you didn't, just put on some antique linen and just go right back in there and add some more of that, okay? There's no point in time when you can't go back to a lighter color and just apply more of it. Okay, watch this right here. See this? As I bring this into this rock here, it makes that clouds stand out even lighter by contrast, okay? The darker you go, the lighter the lights seem. And again, it's by contrast because we don't, we're not working with lighting in the scene. We're just suggesting lighting through the use of shadow. We don't have um, kind of a light bulb in back of our scene illuminating anything. So everything is just all by contrast want something to look lighter, make the area around it darker, and then those light areas will, what well, we always used to say in art school, pop. If you want to make that area pop, you make a little area next to it darker. Pop meaning um, stand out. Stand out visually. Not like a pop-out, um, you know, three-dimensional form in the back. It looks a little bit more three-dimensional, though, when you do the things like this. All right. I really like that walnut stain. I see the walnut stain as, for me, it's kind of more of a, I mean, it could be a main ink, but I, I, I see it as like a, a really great foundation ink for other colors to come. Um, I might layer over a lot of that walnut stain and antique linen, but it's not a lost cause because anything that I layer over that is going to show through it because dye-based inks are all transparent, so if you're missing that kind of base layer, it, it misses a lot of the body that you're establishing. Okay, I, I saw this as I was looking through my uh, reinker uh, vials here. This one's called Ground Espresso. I think it's 
fairly dark, okay. But since I have the reinker for it, I'm going to use it. There's a lot of other colors that I really should get. Um, and when I do get them, I'm usually just getting them in reinker form. Okay. See how dark that is? That's pretty dark, so I'm going to be pretty. <laughs> I'm going I'm going to be pretty careful about my blending that in. Okay, so now see it's all right there, so I've just turned my paper towel and I'm spreading that around. Okay. Add a little bit more like that. Maybe I put a little bit too much in my uh paper towel here, but that's okay. You can control it by just rotating your applicator, whatever one you happen to be using. Um, color box stylus tools were always my favorite, but they don't make them anymore, so I'm... I still have mine, okay, but I'm hardly ever using them. I don't want to use too many things that are completely discontinued. Although I do, you know, in my regular stamping life, but... You do want to use things that um, are available as much as possible. All right, that's looking great. I love this color here. I haven't used it too much. I don't know, sometimes I kind of forget about it. It has a really great kind of... Um, tone to it. I mean, I'm not looking at just ground espresso. I'm looking at ground espresso over the top of those other colors that are underneath it. So it's even richer. This is just the color just as is like that. Not too bad, but look at this kind of glow that you have from that. Okay. I hope I wasn't working off screen too much there. If I was, I'm just going to make this into a time lapse video and skip that whole portion. Okay, now I'm doing this fusion um, scene for a, uh, a group, um, we used to call it bio, I, guess, I think we're still calling it that. It's a group of uh, scenic stamping kind of enthusiasts. It was called by invitation only. I, I, I've been the worst member um, possibly in the history of any type of group. So I, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, send out any uh, scenes for a really long time. Um, for me, I, I like to, well, I like to use um, stamps from other companies anyway, but I started this video channel and um, I really wanted to, uh, we were sending out hard copies too, so anything that I did I really needed to be able to um, reproduce freely without um, kind of, an, you know, utilizing too many other companies' um, stamps in the scenes. Um, most of them are f absolutely fine with me using their, you know, their stamps and uh, videos and uh, postcards and things like that. I completely advertise their company too and that stamp design, whatever stamp designs I use. But um, I don't know. You, you, it's not always, you know, it's not a, you know, always the case. And sometimes I just didn't feel like. Um, Oh, contacting those companies and, companies and saying, hey, can I, you know, can I make this into a postcard? It was just, you know, you got to wait for, back to hear from them. And some companies weren't around any longer, and, you know, it was under new ownership, and you have to get in touch with them, and you don't know them, you know, but you knew the original owner. So, anyways, I didn't like doing just only Stampscape stamps in that type of exchange group, you know. I felt like, I don't know, I don't like... I, I, I tend to think like too much like personal advertising is kind of vulgar, so um, I don't know. I just didn't I just didn't churn out too many scenes, these fusion scenes um, for a while. Um, but anyways, it's been kind of reinvigorated with some new emails going out. So, and then um, we're just kind of exchanging for some of us by email. So I don't know. Uh, going at it again here. So, mustard seed. 
I don't know, this one might be a little bit too bright, but let's see. I think it's going to um, kind of, I don't know, bring make this alive a little bit more. I'm starting to add it first in the darker areas, okay? It's going to look weird until you kind of bring it around in other areas, okay? But um, it's kind of warming it up a little bit, which is what I wanted. It's real. Most of the times, um, the distress inks to me are, um, they're not very intense, okay? But they're not supposed to be. They're supposed to look aged, right? So it's not like a, a bad thing. But this one right here, I find this yellow to be pretty bright. So if you don't want it too bright in some areas, then you know, kind of control the uh, the application of it. And now I do want some brightness in here. I'm le I'm retaining some of the white in there too, okay, especially around the. Uh, <laughs> you know, right there in that, whatever, the plume or what, whatnot. I think my son in ge geology had to learn uh, kind of the various uh, areas of uh, layers of the earth and um, volcanic uh, structuring. What was it? What was the thing with the, the column of uh, magma or whatever, lava? I forgot. I remembered it when he needed to take the test, but um, I think I, it's like my old days of schooling. I think I forgot it instantly after he took it. Those types of tests. Okay, so look at that glowing yellow down there, huh? Kind of going over some of this white here. I, I like getting rid of that white. It, it's giving it kind of this eerie feel. I am retaining some of that white though because I think I want to add in some effects with like pigment ink and white paint pen and whatnot so I do need to retain that but that certainly has kind of a nice kind of eerie glow to it. Look at that. Mustard seed yellow. Pretty good stuff. I think I have to be careful about um, that mustard seed though because um, not only the brightness of it, but I think I tried blending it with some other tone. It might have been green or something like that. Or maybe it was orange. There's a certain tinge to this green, I mean yellow, that um, was slightly unexpected. It didn't, it didn't blend into a, a, co a color that I thought was um, analogous to it, you know, right there on the color wheel with it one time. And it occurred to me, maybe it's going kind of on the other, you know, direction on the color wheel, maybe. All right. Kind of an eerie glow to that. Pretty good glow, though, with those distress inks, and pretty bright. One bright color um, within a color scheme can brighten up the entire color scheme, okay? Every color doesn't have to be bright. Now, if every color is super bright, it can, you know, make the overall piece look even brighter, but it doesn't have to be the case. So some people do their scenes and they work through a, a given color scheme, and sometimes what they, the type of comments that I get sometimes, this is weathered wood, um, that, they, that I hear a lot are, okay, you know, it looks pretty good, but they're missing some of the uh, kind of the brightness that they've seen in my work. Well, a lot of times in my pieces, what I do is I'll, I'll use Marvy inks. Okay. Now, if I was just to characterize Marvy inks, I would say that they're probably um, brighter in terms of their overall intensity level, brighter than any other line of inks. Just in general. Now, there's individual inks that are duller, 
you know, that are of the same hue in the Marvy line than some other lines, okay? But um, just in general, they're really quite bright. So, like I said, um, if you want to just kind of brighten up your overall intensity um, scheme in any scene, you don't have to buy like all new pads, you know, like a whole new line of them. Some of you are saying, yeah, but we want to, you know. <laughs> so they want me to say, hey, you need to buy all of them because then it's like, okay, I'm buying all of them because uh, Kevin said, you know, or something like that. Or that's what they said to do, you know what I mean? And that's fun to do, but you don't have to. You can kind of just get um, um, some primary colors, a light blue, a yellow, and a, like a pink or something like that, and add it to, I don't know, I'm talking about Marvy inks, like a really bright version, and add it to any brand of inks that you already have. So if you're doing kind of color schemes like this, you can add in your primary yellow and it's super bright. Um, if you're doing a blue colored scheme, eight, you know, whatever, you already have eight different blues and I want to buy, buy one more. Well, if you buy one that was like a lot brighter, you can mix it with all those other ones and it'll change completely characteristics of all of those in terms of the end visual effect. Um, so that's about getting mileage, you know, it's about getting a lot of mileage out of your inks, you know, and about may really making use of their, their full potential by just adding in one other ink right over the top or underneath those other ones. Okay, now this is brown from Marvy, okay? I really like my browns um, from Marvy's, um, the number six brown and number 18 dark brown I'll use on here. I think it, it just kind of mellows things out, and it's pretty bright, but um, I don't know, it, 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 it tames everything, no matter how bright something is. Now this one got, it didn't get overly bright, but I, I felt it was, uh, it could use a little mellowing out, okay? Not dulling it out, but just kind of mellowing it out. It still stays as rich as it did before, but it just kind of incorporates things in slightly, okay? So if I put this brown over the top of that yellow, it just, it's a very rich yellow-brown right there, but it's just not quite as hot, you know, as it was before. Now this isn't a very dark brown, but when you're blending it over all those other, see this is a pretty light brown right there, but when you put it over all those other colors of inks that are already underneath there, it makes a d darker looking version. Okay, this is a dark brown here. So this is, you just kind of keep it a little bit more perimeter oriented. You don't bring in, you know, the super dark colors right next to the light ones. Unless it's a very diluted version. Let's say I tap this for a while, you know, like this, and I don't re-ink it. Well, there's a much drier version of that on there, and I can kind of come into these other areas like this and apply a much lighter version of whatever color ink I happen to be using like that so I can get that brown in there, but it's not brown right out of the pad into that. All right, now I'm looking at some fine tuning in here, I'm trying to decide what that might be. I think I want to use some black that'll really kind of incorporate all the imagery into the scene that was stamped out in black by utilizing that same value in the shading process. So that right there will really go on the perimeter like so. One stamp that occurred to me that I should use on here is Dark Cloud. We were talking about this on the on Facebook. And 
this would be a perfect opportunity for it. Okay, look at how, look at how really this black is uh, really framing off the scene and giving a lot of contrast to the uh, lighter portions of the uh, scene. All right. Okay, let me go look for that dark cloud image. All right, this is the dark cloud in it. What this is, if you look at any photographs of clouds, um, cloud cumuluses, like a full, fo you know, cloud landscape, you'll see that similar type of structuring in, within the clouds. And it's this one's called dark cloud, but they're often in blue tones or whatnot, and they're. Um, sandwiched here and there throughout. So it doesn't have to be a foreground cloud, but that's the way that I've uh, generally utilized it in the past. I'll show you what I do with it here. Okay. So cloud formations, you know, we generally think of them as white, okay? Sometimes they're, you know, they're blue or whatnot, and you can stamp this in a lighter blue and just use it for your foregrounds too. So it's not like, it doesn't have to be this ominous cloud, but it does give you the opportunity for it. Okay, now this is more of a solid type of cloud up here, but what I'm doing is I'm doing that same type of thing that I did with the cloud cumulus, a very light textured cloud, okay? Well, let's do this on a dark textured one. Let's wipe off some of this so that it stamps out lighter up here where it's facing the light, okay? Okay, I have it right in there. I didn't, uh, maybe I took off too much of it because I can't, har I can hardly see it in there. Let's go a little bit bolder, okay, in terms of the usages of it. Okay, let me just take off a little bit less. It kind of blended right in with the cloud cumulus there. Okay right there and I need a few more this might actually be a good one to utilize in um, uh, the versifying black having something darker I've never really used versifying black for my clouds but this might be a good opportunity we'll see The thing about versifying black in the clouds is these clouds aren't supposed to be like something that's you know, like five feet from us. You know, it's like several miles away, so I don't know if I'd want anything to stand out that extreme. Okay, I went straight on here. I guess it's fairly, it's, you know, it's fairly dark around here, so maybe I do need to stamp this out much darker. Maybe I was being a little bit too um, conservative with that. Yeah, that looks much better there. Like so. Okay, it's a little bit unbalanced. We need another one right around here, huh? Yeah. Okay. Look at that space in there. I'm not talking about outer space, but distant space. Trying to decide if I need one more down here. I think I might. All right. 
Okay. That looks good to me. I have a lot of uh, <laughs> framing there, uh, to say the least. Oh my gosh. Okay, so look at all that color on here. I haven't done a one of these um, bio, you know, the stamp group scenes for such a long time. I want this one to be really kind of impactful. Well, I wouldn't say this is Halloween, but I don't know. It, you know, it could kind of fit into that thing. What I was originally going to do is I was going. I was thinking about having some hands down here too, like this. And then I would have this other conjurer, and then I have this other guy that's called Victory, a really small one, so it's like hands, hands out, and then another one like way in the distance, you know, with hands up like that, so that, you know, near, far, you know, farther away. Okay, now, let's see here. I'm trying to decide on what I want to do here. Is it time just to go in and start adding in those little types of effects in here and special effects and textures and whatnot? I guess so. I still haven't decided what I want to add here in the foreground yet either, so I've yet to do that. Okay, so let's do this right now. Let's go with this white paint pen. I think this is the one that I just opened, so it's really quite uh, quite good in terms of uh, the, how good it's flowing. It's almost flowing too much. Sometimes I like to get like smaller little dots, but the dot is so flowing and consistent. Okay, so I'm adding some little highlights onto the uh, the island mountain. I'm kind of hitting the areas that are uh, on the mountain, that are lighter on the mountain, I should say, and just kind of re-illuminating those areas. So it looks like they're a little bit highlighted or lit, I guess you can say, or whatnot. Um, okay, let's do some of these clouds here. These clouds, I'm going to illuminate some of them on the portion of the cloud facing my light source. Okay, so the clouds under over the um, volcano will be bottom lit. Okay, and the clouds to the side of the light source are going to be side lit. And the clouds underneath the light source are going to be top lit. Does that make sense? Just kind of have the highlights always kind of facing your dominant source of light. Okay, see how that goes. Look at that lighting in there. Look at that dark cloud, huh? They really gave that area some depth. I even put some highlights on the dark cloud, but it's on the side facing the uh, light source. Okay. These rocks on down here. I can put some highlights on my rocks. The clouds down here. Are being top lit.
Yeah. All right. Now, this one should be one that should be really fun to do that splatter painting, texturizing. Let's get some uh, space here for that. All right, Dr. Martens, bleed proof white. <laughs> I recommend this uh, material for all of your uh, supply uh, repertoire. <laughs> You'd be surprised at just how many things you can use this for. If you just kind of texturized anything, you could be a, I don't know, a card for practically a happy birthday, you know, you kind of sprinkle it around and it kind of makes it a little bit more festive. It's like confetti or something like that. Um, it could be stars. Um, I don't know. Just little light flares or something like that, too. And not just for landscape, you know, scenic stamping uh, at all. Just if you like texture and illumination, this is really fun stuff. Okay. Let's see how this is going to, I'm going to start kind of concentrated it in this area like that, but we'll move it about. I never know which direction this is going to spray, so it's kind of going out this way. When you're using an old toothbrush like this, you never know. It's like shooting backwards, like this way. <laughs> no. See that right down there? Look at that. Watch this right around here. Yeah, it's getting on my hand, but that's okay. This stuff, the Dr. Martens washes out instantly if you get your, you know, any of your hands or anything like that. A couple big dots like that, but that's okay. Especially for a scene like this that's so explosive. All right, and it's entirely possible to go nuts with this, you know, and use too much, I guess, you know. But if you do use too much and you get like, oh my gosh, that's, you know, so much spray. Take a, just a dry um, paper towel or something like this and just buff it right off. It'll come right off of there. And it won't leave any kind of stain because this stuff dries really quickly. But look at that texture in there. Look at three-dimensional. Um, this piece looks with that extra texturing on there. I try to make it look, you know, fairly three-dimensional as is. Um, but um, doing things like this, kind of texturizing like that, really kind of adds to it. Okay, now here's the thing too. If you want to stain some of these little dots, you can go back in and you can, you know, add some tone over some like this. And it kind of just, it adds what cover color you're going back there and tapping on it too. Okay. So let's let like this area. Let's say that got too busy, okay? You just take some color. Let's see if there's any color on here. Uh, let's go back to that walnut stain. Okay. And just go back in here. The dots are still there, but they're just brown. They're walnut colored now. See what I mean? So you can just keep doing that. And then you can do things like this too. You can um, spray in here stain all those little dots a certain color and then you can spray it again and then you'll have white dots and brown dots or whatever color you use you know those yellow ones would be kind of interesting too uh, you know that mustard you can make some mustard colored uh, little dots that'd be kind of interesting so this is just kind of mellowing it out a little bit so those really big white dots in the paint there um, maybe that was too you know too much so i'm just going back in here and staining them a little bit of color, so they don't stand out quite as much. You know, they're still there, though. Like I said, if I don't like them, I can just buff them right out of there. 
even after they dry. It's you know, it's a very forgiving um, substance to use on there. If I'm doing it on matte paper, it's probably sticking to it a little bit more. But on the glossy cardstock, it really um, you know you're able to move it around quite a bit. All right, so there's that. Okay. I think I want to add a little bit of um, kind of a magical kind of essence to that figure. It's kind of, you know, it kind of just blends into the background some, somewhat. So let's go like this. Let's add two large spheres right above um, his hands like that. I'll let that dry quite a bit before I... Um, kind of create these glowing little um, balls, spheres, okay, like that. So those two large ones right there. Now. Um, I, I'm going to add in some foreground to this. I need to start thinking about that. But let's try some white pigment ink in here first. Let's go for a little bit of textural range. Okay. And I like my clouds to be kind of soft and billowy. So here's where I benefit from retaining some of that white of the card you know, the paper, the cardstock, okay? Because I can go into it now with white uh, pigment ink and add that same type of touch right down in here. And this is where, you know, there's all the textures in here are pretty extreme and sharp. So this is a way I can go in here now and add a soft element to counterbalance all of that super crisp um, texturing in here from the crisp impressions to the white dots to the um, you know the spray um, paint even though you know there's a fine spray there's still very crisp little white dots so um, this is a way just to s add a soft element somewhere in the scene it doesn't have to be soft everywhere but it, like I said, it just kind of counterbalances um, that and adds um, a wider textural range um, to the scene. Like I said, it doesn't, you don't have to do it everywhere. In fact, I don't like it everywhere because it's, uh, I don't want the whole thing soft. You know, I want there to be soft and crisp. Okay, so see that soft glowing light in there? And we can add it right around our our plume in here as well. Okay, I've left some areas of the cloud a little bit lighter up here.
Okay, I think that is about it in terms of texture. Now, I went a little bit further with that because this is going to dry. And when it dries, it dries darker. And then plus when I spray seal it, we lose some of that too. So I'm going a little bit, you know, it becomes much more transparent when you spray seal. Okay, so I need to decide what I want to stamp in the foreground. I do want some foreground in here because that'll really add some additional impact. But what to do? Probably just some bony trees or something like that. I'm going to go on the lookout. But, oh, I, I could use some other images from other companies too, maybe? I don't know. I'll see what I have. Okay, it's looking so busy in here. I, I don't want to go with anything too heavy. I was thinking about heaviness so that it would stand out on here, but it's so dark around there. Um, I don't know, I think that would be too much, so I'm going to go... I think the crooked limb is a really good um, um, solution here. It's nice and bony and craggy, and I think that would contrast against those softer clouds. And it, But it's, it's spindly, so, you know, all the background will show right through it, you know, without too much um, coverage, okay? Overlapping and kind of a blocking out of form. Okay, but I almost forgot. Um, let's go into those little spears there. And um, let's bring some illumination to those. Okay. And they should be nice and dry by now. So I have my cotton swab. This one's a brand new one, so I need to kind of loosen it up. And when it's true cotton, it really kind of loosens up very nicely and forms a very soft applicator. So if you want a soft-looking um, visual, then you have to use a soft applicator. Okay. So I'm really going to blot off some of that. I've kind of frayed my top here, and I'm kind of blotting it off, but it's also kind of smashing it down and kind of moving some of that ink back up into the, uh, the swab and flattening it at the same time. All right, let's see here. <laughs> Maybe I took off too much ink. It's like 30 taps to get just that bare, you know, that barely glowing little spear. You see how that kind of texture, oops, kind of stands out down there. Doesn't that kind of stand out? I really don't need to dab off my, uh, oops, <laughs> maybe I do need to dab it off. It's a little bit too much there. I was going to say my pad is fairly dry at this point in time. But a lot of your pads out there are very juicy, so be careful about that. Don't you know you don't want to be applying like blobs of paint. I just got a little blob of paint, it wasn't too bad though, but so I just kept tapping on there to kind of move it around. Alright, let's get some of this out there. Okay, so you see those glowing little spheres, it's like this little magical Type of thing happening right there. I'm kind of tempted to kind of bring some other little dots in here too, but um, I don't think I will. I used to like bringing um, different types of geometric graphics into this too, and that's that's a possibility there, but I'm not sure if I want to do that yet or here. Let's see if I add a circle right here. I like to emphasize certain types of um, um, compositional structures in here, like we can kind of see this pyramid with the um, mountain going down like that, and the eye carries down, it goes down here like that, and then this is kind of a circle right here, so there's kind of a triangle and a circle in there, and sometimes I would actually draw a circle in there with a white paint pen, or a white gel pen back in the day. Didn't have a really good white paint pens, but... Um, I don't know, that's always fun to do, and I like to emphasize certain types of geometrics uh, and uh, structuring with those types of forms like that. Or, I don't know, shapes in here. Okay, so here's the um, 
crooked limb. And I'm, I'm using um, Versifying Black for this. So this is just kind of adding in additional texturing, additional layering. Um, layering creates distance, potentially. It doesn't even have to really make sense to, it's just, I don't know, it just makes for a kind of an interesting visual, I think. It doesn't have to be like something like, um, you wouldn't see, you know, what are we doing? We, you know, where are we, you know, viewing the scene from a thicket or something like that? I, I think it just makes for an interesting textural visual. Sometimes, you know, a lot of the things that I do, I I think about it in terms of the uh, the actual location, but this is kind of a, like a mystical scene here, so, you know, it doesn't have to make sense, okay? You know, like you're, we're witnessing this from, uh, you know, hiding in a, you know, a bush or tumbleweed or something like that, but see that right there? See, I'm be, I was careful not to just stamp over my figure, too, so I have one down here, and kind of one above it. This one comes in a little bit more. See those textures down there? It's kind of subtle in many ways. You know, it doesn't stand out too much, but you can view in like that. Look at that distance that's created in there. All right, I think that is it. I can, I don't know, I was thinking about coloring that character's cape something. Maybe I will. They all come in with something a little bit different. And, you know, with the blue here. Remember, I'm going blue over the top of all that yellow in there, so it's not super blue, but you know, just a little bit of a complementary um, temperature color. Nothing big. I mean, this figure right here, there's not a lot of area in there to color in. It's mostly silhouette, so... Okay, I think that is it. My first bio scene in a long time. I hope you like it. Bend that counter. Bend that. I wish I had 12-point cardstock, but I bought tons of 10-point uh, cardstock at one point in time. and I'm still using it years later. One ream of that cardstock really goes a long way. Okay, so anyways, there we have it. Uh, fun scene to do. A lot of layering, texturing, and coloring. And I think we've created a decent amount of depth in here. If you have any questions, drop me a note in the comment section. And thanks, as always, for tuning into the Stampscapes channel.